Hi, Matt Batty here again. It's been a couple of months since we last touched on the topic of interest rates, but a lot's happened in that last couple of months. We've continued to see the Reserve Bank raising rates, not only consistently for a few months in a row now, but raising at very aggressive levels at sort of 50 basis points uh, at a time. So not only we come um, a very long way in a relatively short period of time, this is really unprecedented both in the rate and the amount of rise, but particularly from the base it's coming from. So what's the impact of that? What does that mean for people with loans or considering loans? I thought what we might do today is get our resident mortgage broker, uh, Neil Smith, on a call and delve into more the, the lending side of things from the, from the lending institution's point of view. What are we seeing in terms of their reaction to these rate rises, how are they passing them on, you know, what does that mean in terms of the way they're structuring their products. So, welcome Neil. Yeah, welcome Matt, thanks mate, thanks for having us. Great mate, I might start with the first thing is, we, we, I just want to quickly revisit the sort of the yield curve to set the picture for everybody. Um, for those who, uh, who aren't familiar with the yield curve, really what that refers to is, is how interest rates change based on time frames. So, at the, the, the short end of the yield curve, uh, we have very short term rates. So think of that, for example, as say a bank account, an at call account means you're lending money to the bank, but you could take it back at any point in time. And then that might go out to 30, 60, 90 days, things like term deposits, out to one, two, three, five, and even 10 and 20 year, 30 year government bonds. And, and the yield curve really re refers to how does the rates, interest rates change over those time frames. So, a normal yield curve, what we call a normal yield curve, is starts very low, ri rises, you know, as two, three sort of year time frames, and then tends to flatten out and only gradually rise over the longer term. And that's what we call a normal yield curve. In other words, interest rates in the future are likely to be fairly similar to today, and therefore there's only a slight penalty for that length of time, if you like. And then the two big deviations we see from that is what we call an inverted yield curve, and that is where the longer you go into that duration, interest rates are expected to drop. The market thinks rates will drop, so the, the interest rates actually are lower, say, over the longer term than they are in the short term. And then the reverse of that is where interest rates are expected to be much higher in the long term, you get what we call a steep yield curve. So that, you know, that graph continues to rise up. So obviously we've seen a, a very aggressive uh, rate rise, series of rate rises in the last couple of months. How has that played out in terms of the you know, the fixed rate market, which is more linked to fixed home loan rate markets, more linked to those market rates, if you like, versus, say, your, your more standard or discount variables. What, what sort of delta are we seeing in the rates there, Neil? Well, we've had five interest rate rises, Matt, as we know, over, over the last five months. The last half of a percent will probably make your average loan at a bank around about the four and a half percent interest rate for a variable rate loan when all the banks eventually pass on that half percent. The two-year fixed rate's about 1% higher than that in general terms, and with three to five years, it's only about 1.4 to 1.5 above that. Um, it's been very much historical that we don't usually have half percent interest rate rises since two, you know, 2005 onwards. They've only ever gone up in a quarter. So this is sort of foreign times, but the gap is narrowing between the, the gap that you're referring to, um, but, but it's about 1% at this point in time. Yeah, okay. And, and that would suggest that the market really hasn't quite caught up. In other words, there's an expectation that rates are going to continue to rise, um, you know, in the, in the coming months, if not in the next sort of six to 12. So um, that's, that's probably in line with our expectations of where we think the Reserve Bank is going to take this because they're really trying to inflate that, fight that inflation uh, issue. Uh, and, you know, the, the issue partly with that, I suppose, is that with, as, as you referred to, that the, the aggressiveness of this rate rise, the number of the rate rises, and as you said, how quickly they've occurred. And the lag in that now, we're getting into very uncharted territory, not just in terms of the severity of those rises, but we really don't know what the effect of those rises have been yet, um, because, you know, we really haven't had the time for that sort of to filter through. So is there anything you know, how should people respond to this? Is it sort of the case that now um, with this sort of changing landscape, lenders are, are more likely to respond to, you know, pricing reviews for their existing customers? Or is it very much a, you know, banks are hungry for new business and, you know, refinance is, is much more attractive? How, how does it look? Yeah, that's a good question. Banks in general, when you go to do a refinance of a bank at, the, at this point in time, the, the borrower will get a phone call from their and on a retention purpose. 
Uh, one of the biggest banks in um, being CBA uh, had a, a special product and have recently just changed that where they were, they would, you know, a lot of the group was people were refinancing out of that because there were better rates elsewhere. But now they're being a lot more competitive from a client that I did just recently that they actually played the game and reduced their bank rate by 0.5. But to now it's a very, very good time to make sure that you've got the right deal for you being a cost effective deal where the interest rates are going up at this type of rate. Because what happens is banks just put you in the back pocket. They've got you. Uh, they, they think the borrower thinks it's all too hard. And um, so it's an advantageous time now to, to really shop around and have a look at the rates you're on. I think we get, you know, it, depending on when you think the, um, the interest rates are going to stop and that's open for general discussion. When do you think that they might, might cease to, to, to change and how many more movements do we have in it? Yeah, well, look, it looks like the, if, if we listen to what the Reserve Bank are, are, are sort of trying to say, if you like, as opposed to what they're saying, which is, you know, always a little bit of sort of reading between the lines. It seems that they're very, uh, very hell bent on, on on getting inflation under control. And by inflation, and I won't get into that topic too much because we've dealt with that in other videos. But um, by inflation, they really do mean that CPI number. It's 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 very elevated and expect to remain elevated for some time. And we will see, and we're starting to see some relief from that now from the sort of transient, let's call it the transient supply chain type issues, um, you know, with petrol prices coming down, shipping costs and some of those sorts of things sort of dropping off. But we're certainly not seeing that and we don't expect to see that drop back to the levels that will bring the CPI back into that sort of 2 to 3% range that, um, that the RBA is, is fixated on. So, so we do expect the Reserve Bank to continue to push higher. And, and one of the reasons for that is, is because the balance is very asymmetric. So keep in mind that, that the number of people who borrow and, and the percentage of population affected by that is extremely uh, low compared to the, the part of the population that's affected by higher prices. Basically, everyone's affected by higher prices and only around 40% you know, uh, of the population actually has significant home loan debt. So they'll always lean towards you know, overcooking inflation, if you like, or overcooking the rate rises to bring inflation under control, rather than say, you know, slowing the economy, because the effect of that means more unemployment, but we're coming from an extremely low rate. So yeah, our expectation is they'll almost certainly overshoot, rises going into probably even into early next year, um, slowing the rate, I think from here potentially, hopefully. Um, but but you can see in some of the yield curve is, dances around with the idea that rates might even be slightly lower next year, but from a higher base than they are now. Yeah, so, and, and from a bank's perspective, what they actually look at, they always qualify you higher than the current rate that's advertised. For example, four and a half, the bank will qualify you at six, well, six and a half slash 7%. So as to make sure that the lender or the borrower can afford those repayments if rates do go up. So they've always a buffer in there, which is a which is an ASIC requirement and an APRA requirement, more the Australian Potential Regulatory Authority, to make sure that people can afford their loans. So that's a comforting thing to know with these rate rises. But the, definitely, from my perspective, the variable rate, rate is the better way to go at this point in time. I think, um, um, that, you know, with the one to one and a half percent differentiation between interest rates between your variable and your fixed, that's a, that's a lot of rate rises. Although in saying that we've had four in four months, there's got to be that some slowdown at some stage. Yeah, there is. But but again, going back to that fix, those fixed rates, they are based on an expectation of where rates will kind of get to. And our certainly our best guess at the moment would be no further than that, you know, in the sort of medium term. And as you say, you've got to you've got to close that gap a little bit in the first place. So, OK, so let's get back to cost, because at the end of the day, it's, um, you know, it's, at the end of the day, it's the cost of money is, is the most important thing. And, and that's what interest rates really, really are. And if look, if, if you're talking about a very large loan, the interest rate really is the defining factor. But there are other lots of other potential hidden costs and variables when it comes to the cost of loans. Um, what what sort of things will affect how much people pay loans in terms of packages, you know, offset accounts, those sorts of things? Are there sorts of things that people need to be aware of when they're looking at the, the total cost? Well, basically, at the end of the day, you've got to look at the fees and charges that the bank's charging you for that to have that particular facility. Like, say, what you need to do is equate it. Um, like, if they're charging you $400 a year, at the end of the day, the borrower doesn't really care if it's interest or fees. You need to add those mm. both together to give you a real cost 
of what your loan is actually costing you. It may be easy for you to have the package and you might get 0.2% off, but are you really saving that amount of money? And also conversely, a lot of the banks out there try and market a offset account to you. And like, you know, to, for you to have, to, you really need a, a, probably a solid $10,000 in your offset account to justify paying the fee that it costs you to have that. So those are the type of things that we look at for you um, to in regards to of what package is best suiting you. Another form of way to save money is to obviously put as much money against your home loan, which is a real saving um, on your home loan and having the ability to redraw that at a later date just in case is another avenue without having to pay fees and charges. I'm not a big fees and charge man. I don't like paying banks fees if we don't need to, but it all depends on your personal situation of what and, and where you sit in the, of how much money you have and what your financial situation is, what's best for you. Yeah, you're right. And the, 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 to add the strategic level to that as well, offset accounts can be very handy strategic um, uh, products, if you like, if, if, if we look at sort of the longer term strategy, particularly run with clients where the nature of the, the property might change from personal to investment, et cetera, over time. Uh, but but in, in those cases, they can be very valuable. But, but in the case of just simply trying to offset the interest for loans where um, those strategies aren't applicable, things like um, redraws are, are more than... Uh, more, you're more than enough to sort of take care of most people. So yeah, getting that strategy overlay on the product, not just looking at what's the short-term interest rate differential, but how am I going to use these products over time can make a huge difference to yep. you know, how much interest yep, and in much. many cases, how much tax people pay as well. Yep. Exactly right. Um, so yeah, so, so it's yeah, so, individual situations up to Melinda. Yep, yep. And so with interest only versus principal and interest, that you, there used to be a pretty clear line in the sand with that back, certainly back in the day, couple of decades ago or more when I was uh, when I was actually involved in lending but is there much difference these days with interest only versus variable and is is there advantages that people can 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 look at there well in summary um, if you've got an investment property we always look at the interest only versus the principal and interest factor on a investment property um, as a general rule of thumb and don't take this as advice that you shouldn't it's each to your individual situation but if you have a home debt of some description and you want to go and buy an investment property, we'll always look at the interest only factor for your investment property, because the object is that you want to own your own home. So we would rather you pay off more money onto your own home rather than the investment property for the tax advantages which your tax accountant would be able to tell you, or indeed your financial planner. From the other side, if you don't have a home loan against you, your home, and you would like to go and uh, buy an investment property or investment purpose, uh, we would probably encourage principal interest because at the end of the day, you will need to obviously make those repayments and own the property outright. But again, it depends on the advice of your accountant. Hmm. There is a difference between the rates, and that's the biggest driving factor between right. half to 1% difference between interest only versus principal and interest. So once again, they're numbers that we can crunch together to find out what the, what's best for you at the end of the day because the tax offset or the tax offset for that 1% rise may not be worthwhile you doing it. Yeah, exactly right. And it's going to depend very much on you know, the net effect of that depreciation, the property, what the actual yields and costs, etc. So yeah, so that that's a good point. But no, knowing that there is that that potential cost difference, you know, in the rate, um, that's important to know. But you know, ultimately, what it's as you said earlier, what does it ultimately mean for you in terms of actual cost? So it's not necessarily straightforward as exactly yeah, right. it might look like it's more expensive. But at the end of the day, in your case, it may not be so. Look, is there anything else people uh, should be aware of when it comes to refinance? Is you know, is it is it a difficult thing to do? You know, how long does it take at the moment? Is there is there any, you know, things that are you know that, that people that, that can help people get ready if they if they're considering it? Well, refinancing at this point in time is definitely worthwhile. People having a look at uh, it is a little painful process. I have to say, like because you will get some calls from your current financier um, to try and retain you or whatever the case may be. But you've always got to remember they've treated you this way for a long period of time, and if we can, and if we can get you a cost saving, because the idea is is to put more money in your pocket in these cost cost of times, and that's the whole object of why you would want to refinance. There is a cost to refinance. In general, it's about six hundred dollars um, by the time you pay the discharge fees and the appropriate government registration charges. Um, but what we try and do is to, to work out how much you can actually save. And how long is it going to take you to get your costs back? 
between rates that you have or rates that are held at the other bank. But it's a free, it's no obligation free quote. Like a good while, it's a good opportunity to just make sure you've got the right loan right now with all the activity that's happening in interest rates out in the marketplace. All right. Well, thanks, Neil. That's uh, that's been quite helpful. And uh, yeah, if, obviously, if anyone's got any questions, they can email us through, and uh, we'll certainly put those to Neil, uh, or you can contact him via you know our website as well. So, thanks for joining me, Neil, and uh, we'll get you in next time uh, where yeah. there's something uh, important happening in the in the interest rate sector. Yeah, been a pleasure. All the best to all our clients out there. All right, thanks, Neil.